They're white supremacists and Nazis. They don't even know it. Why do you guys hate Jews so much? They're not only anti-Jew, but they want Muslims to kill them. So Islamophobic. They don't know that Muslims will kill every one of them. Invite the Muslims. It would be great with the African bees. Too stupid. Don't tell anybody you're in college. Look at this. Look at it. It's, it's so third tracky. They're all repeating themselves. Happy Halloween! <laughs> Where's the beat? Yeah, I would expect this in seventh grade. These idiots are supposedly in college. How embarrassing. Common core. Hey, what are you going to put on your resume? You cried about Ben Shapiro? Look at that sign. He says, no, you're a clown. Oh, no, you're a towel. <laughs> Oh, I wish there was some lights. Someone get some spotlights on these guys. Oh, wait a minute. You're a tall. <laughs> what is that about? That's great. I'll pass. Would you like an anthrax covered flyer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we got the face cover people. We got our famous Antifa. Your face isn't covered enough not to be A Jew who hates Jews. Look at that. This, this is comedy. Communists, no Marxists. Look, it's the Stanford Antifa. Check it out. No Marxists, no socialists at all. This is The Nazis and they don't even know it. They'll hit you with six and white supremacists and everything else, and then they say we're the Nazis. So see, it's a sad world. Poor pathetic little children. That's the best one so far. Thank you. Welcome to the petting zoo. Please don't feed we'll the animals. We need for identification <laughs> later. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Other way around. We're doing Other pig races later. It's more to identify you, you after you guys have attacked so. Hey, are you going to put on your resume? We you complain about this. Shut up. 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 Take their federal funding. Take their federal funding. You guys look like you're
full of hate. Man, look at those faces. Seriously, look at those faces. There you go. Thank no, you. I, oh, that back to hate. I, I think they gotta go to the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> oh. That's mean. Shapiro is welcome. <laughs> Do your parents know you're out here? here? I don't think they would appreciate you guys using their hard-earned money on this. I remember when I would stick a pineapple up my ass and watch protests too. I'd have the same look on my face. <laughs> Hey, hey, should we make Ben Shapiro the governor? No. <laughs> he should. I mean, I would totally vote for him over somebody else. It's right a now. joke. But he should. It's a joke. Shapiro has the best line. <laughs> Alrighty. The lines are for Shapiro, not you. Bags, please open the bags. They're all right, but I don't want to give them the credibility. No, not till later. That's exciting in and of itself. You'll see them later when they have their crowbars. You got a bag right there. It's a camera. It's a bag, camera. right? It's a camera. It's a camera bag. Thank you. Changed in the blink of an eye, and we're just bathing in it. You got a ticket, right? Cool. Awesome. I'm doing some recording. What do you? Tell me, you came out here, and how long did you know about this? How long did you know about this, and uh, what made you decide to come out? Since it was announced by the uh, Stanford uh, Young Republicans. You heard it from them? Yes. Oh, yeah? Yeah. And so you just you decided to come out. You, are you a fan of Ben Shapiro? Uh, I am a fan of free speech. I'm a fan of a freedom of assembly. And I'm not a fan of people that want to physically stop people from exercising their rights. And so do I like him? I love everybody. I'm loving what you're saying right now. Believe it or not, probably most of us feel the same way. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, cool. Hey, well, get your spot in line and don't lose it. I'll see you in there. Good to see you. Did you pick the red with the red? Outside. I like your own people. I remember my son's right here. <laughs> I like when they're quiet. I know. That's the best sound they can make. I don't like black people. I'm glad this is good. I'm, I'm glad this, they get to document this. Talking about intimidating while they're standing here thinking that they're Yes, we're the ones who are intimidating. That's us, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I see my face in all of you. All of you. That's how high I am. I'm just kidding. I am just for one second. How about you, buddy? Just aim it at them. Uh, oh, I need to go in for a second. Okay, the door's open. Sit my beverage. Oh, you're going to be able to get that in. Gabriel. Gabriel. Oh, you're right. I thought that was your husband's name. I have to say, you guys are very polite for like antiques and stuff. It's 
618. It's bad. These guys don't know how to tell time. It's canceled. Ben Shapiro went home. Either that or Ben Shapiro's at their house. <laughs> <laughs> I used to listen to Limp Biscuit. You know, one of my. You ever listen to Limp Biscuit? Uh huh. Yeah, just that really song. Oh, yeah. yeah. And when I do, it's really loud. There's the leash right there. <laughs> I know you guys are gonna grow up at some point. I'm sorry. <laughs> I hope, anyways. That's an assumption. That's an assumption. I'm gonna do it on Twitter so I don't get the Facebook jail again. What kind of video am I getting? This is worse than staking out the bathroom in Oregon. Nazi that's a good one. one. There's one of her. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Make sure you check yourself, okay? Stanford Nazis. I'm gonna add a oh, couple sorry. more. I gotta stop. I'm so hey. bad looking at you. I do. I'm sorry. <laughs> Where's the one where she flipped me off? That's the one I need. Mean. Oh, there she is. Thank you, Pear. I extend the stay. These poor guys. <laughs> Come on, let's get the time moving. I have all the rights to fight to get the back. Yeah, yeah. 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 30 years ago, yeah. who yeah. are so excited yeah. their kids are going to go there. I mean, there's just this great yeah. sense. You can find yourself selves at Stanford Nazis. Hashtag Stanford Nazis. Find right. your picture and tag yourself. Let me go to Woo! Oh, okay. Hey, Mama, look at me. <laughs> you? I was in school today. You're looking, ah! the way you're looking is the way I used to work at little girls. <laughs> I feel you, sister. <laughs> that anger, oh, rage in your body. Yep, I did that too. Good stuff. Good stuff. I read you. Again, another one, probably on the wrong side. These are rare days, man. This is like history making. Once again. Let's see if we think that I think that came out. Oh, that's a great one. Look at that. Awesome. I love it, man. It's good. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Action pack video of me waiting in line. Okay, the scientist. But uh, he's going to you trying to hit with that? I, I mean, where are you trying to skate with that? So, I think it was more of the surgery side of things. I don't know what audiology is that. My mom was a speech therapist. Oh, okay. So we, she knew a lot about that. And my husband actually worked for a company in the park called the Ear Lens. Uh -huh. And so Oh tearing aids? Well, but not normal hearing aids. They're actually uh, laser. Oh wow. They, uh, they're uh, and I don't know that, but like at the quality party they used to have we're having in the news, you guys. They're not Yeah, that was a little less than a group. When you want it, you got it. Let's start it up for the No, 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 no
no, 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 it's called slice when it's fried. You got it. It's slice when it's fried. No, no, don't, 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 don't break, don't break the rhythm. It's fried. It's fried. You need to be moving in the building. I was laughing so hard when I heard that. I'm like, really? Fried. Now, that's what I call it. It's fried. Fried now. I have to say, I totally feel you making the sign. George Soros, you spicy guys, you didn't have to do all the work, but I gotta hand it to you. I think it's the leader. Hell to the chief! I'm your gonzo journalist. You're my Portuguese photographer. Is he the I'm free. Let's break down. He's into it. At that time, you know, we didn't have had to have a Are you, are you here on your... Are you, nope, they're scattered throughout the line. Oh, they're scattered throughout the line. She's not okay. here, but Cindy, uh, Louisa's probably in the back. She just texted me like about two minutes ago, so she just got quiet. Uh, how dare you not know what that means? Oh, is that You've got to be wise friends with now. How dare you? Clearly, free speech is only for those with power. That guy that's talking to you guys. <laughs> Keep your hands on your sign if you like 80s music. <laughs> oh, hell yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Is that, what's his face? Um, um, um. The beard guy? Victor. Is that Victor from the one that got assaulted in Palo Alto? Huh? Save my spot. Excuse me. What do you think, a movie star? Uh, got it uh, got it. Oh, my God, I don't know. about to go attack this guy or No, I, I, I don't know why the hell it's happening so late. You know we used to do at concerts when this kind of thing would happen? Everyone would start chanting, he's fucked up. The show didn't start with it. It begins to be pretty much My friend just texted me, are you going to go out and jump in the air? How far from the line go? I don't know. Why don't you go take a look? Let us know. I trust you. Yeah. You can hold spot. Take the spot. Grab my baggage. Sure. If you would, you hold my spot, but I'm holding the Cindy spot. Sorry, kids. Well, his son is over here holding the spot. Okay. I'll be back. Well, you're not giving me anything of value. I don't know. I said, hold me down. You know yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anything of value? That was Victor. Here, hold my tacones. Let's see how long this line is. Feel free to speak. What a line. Oh, no way. What's up, man? How you doing? Yeah, dude. Welcome to Ben Shapiro, bro. What brings you out here today? Uh, ben Shapiro. It's all about the Jewism, right? Huh? It's all about the Jewism. Yeah. I'm hoping he'll give me a yarmulke. <laughs> when it was Make America Great Again knee pads? Uh, yeah. For blowing Israel? I'm just yeah. kidding. Oh, I'm a terrible person. I'm Israel. You're, are you Israel? Nice to meet you, bro. Are you, are you a Ben Shapiro fan? Yeah. You must be. And you're excited to be here? Oh, yeah. How long have you been in America? Well, my whole life. Your whole life? Yeah. You have an accent. Well, really? I guess I've been around some people with accents and kind of rubbed oh. off. Okay, well, well, hey, welcome to America. I hope you enjoy the event, bro. Thank you. Have a good one. Hey, bro, enjoy. I love nuggets. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
This is the two. USA, baby. Yeah. Enjoy. Ben Shapiro. Huh? Okay. Oh, what are you in disguise? What the yes, in disguise. Kick her ass! <laughs> I found a space. I don't know. I was just saying maybe I can get you into our line, but I don't know. Alex Kent. Laura, the Korean girl, the pretty girl. Yes. You should text me. I gotta come down. You're going that way. I'm going this way. Say hello to you. Okay. I'm seeing. I'm trying to see how long. She's further up. The line goes on. My next event, I'll be, uh, next oh, I'm supposed to start at 7. Okay. I have one. I need one. I have a grand one. All right, we're trying, right, so Mike has said he's about 50 yards up. Hey, hey, hey Louisa. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Pro man. man. You remember me? Yes, where'd you at? San Jose, downtown Chicago. Oh, shit. How you, you been, bro? Tim? Yes, you know he's, he's in the meetup group. Yeah. Oh, you know each other. Are you in the meetup group at all? Bay Area yeah. Conservatives meetup? That's how we met. We were at the, the yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, that. That's what I thought. You're at, yeah, you're at one of the one this of the is, events? Uh, okay. Roman. This is Micah. Cool, awesome. Nice to meet you. Micah, oh, likewise. But awesome. you also have a profile called Stephen on the on the website. Is that right? You got Stephen and it was Stem, It was Stephen Poles. I didn't know I could, I, had, I thought I had to use my real name. I finally changed it to my pseudo name. Oh, I get yeah. it. Yeah. No, okay. I'm pro man now. You're, uh, you're on YouTube, right? Yes. Okay. So Are you documenting this, this event? Yeah, I gotta see how long your, uh, so this is. This is Lauren. Hi. Hello. Hi. This Hi. is Micah. Albert. This is Albert. I'm sorry, Albert? Albert. 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 And this is Stephen, a.k.a. Croman. Uh, let me ask you, Croman, <laughs> what, what is your opinion of the intensity and dedication of this protesting over there? Oh, man. I think it's a little There's weak a today. I'm going to call it anti I was expecting a little better. Anti-Jew. I was <laughs> expecting a little more energy. Like 25 pizzas. So basically, they're paying protesters. Are you? Yeah. There's no ambulance outside, and there's not a Did lot of... Did you sign both recalls? No flag jackets. No, I haven't yet. Would you like yeah. to? They didn't Okay. Or do you want to do it later? Could I do it later? Yeah. I'm trying to get the scope of the line. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Or I'm just going to keep care, checking out his line. It was good seeing you guys, right? Good luck with your yes, video, thank you. Recall Gavin Newsom, anyone? Yeah. 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 Recall sure. Gavin. I'll sign now. What Y'all better. Yeah. Save yourself a beat down. Yeah. Recall yeah. Gavin Newsom. Yeah. Wait. Save yourself a beat down. Recall Gavin Newsom. I'm just kidding. We're the Ben Shapiro fans. Alright, there's one. <laughs> yeah! Don't forget! USS! I'm like, keep going. Unless there's anything you want to say, what brought you out here tonight? You love what journal, paper, newspaper? YouTube channel Crow Man 17. C R O W M A N 1 7. Crow Man. Just want to hear Ben speak. Yes. Just want to hear Ben speak. Awesome. Thank you for coming out. And man, this is worth it. I hope you guys feel the same. Just give me the facts. Just give me the facts. Okay. Give me the facts. I'll give you the facts right now. USS Liberty, 150 dead Americans. Look it up. Everything okay? Damn, this thing is still going. <laughs> what a line. Thank you all for coming out. I'm sure you all love Ben Shapiro, so do I. <laughs> but I like him. Howdy. Holy crap. Wow, that is the scale. What up? Okay, so I... Unbelievable. Yeah, she was the man in service. <laughs> and that's it, folks. All these people for Ben Shapiro. Here at Stanford University. Now, how many of them are Ben Shapiro fans? How many of them are Goifers? I don't care. I love them all. <laughs> 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 
All right, everybody, heading back. I wish it was more light, but this is what you're getting, y'all. Right. So maybe there's some countries. I don't know. Maybe North Korea, but I'm not going to go into that. My three countries that I would like to point to you, sir: Japan, Singapore, and France. Those are the three most ideal systems. Well, they we're have not talking about Singapore. We're system. talking about wow, here. three. That's a very there's small so percentage of all the countries in the world. I would not go with that. That's a vaccine that kills more people than it saves. There you go. Wait, wait, what vaccine are you talking about? I'm using that as an example. Three countries out of all the countries in the world. That's sad. There are multiple other countries that we can point to as well. Australia has better health care than we do. Canada has better health care than we do. Uh, saying that it's just better, better is subjective. Poland has a better health care than we do. All subjective. Okay. It's, it's better. Okay. All right. Would you like to talk about it with me or would you just like to no, say No, tell me more. I, I want to hear okay. what you have to say. Okay. Great. So I mean, besides just saying it's better. All right. Great. So in a two-tiered system in which the government will pay 70% of it and the citizens pay 30% of it, right? Now, depending on your income, that might change a little bit. If you're poor, maybe the government pays a little bit more. But if you make, and it usually there's around 64000 or more, you're paying at least 30% of it. Now, you do have the option to uh, opt out of the system, right? You can opt out of it and then you can choose to... Uh, 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 to get a tax break and get your own private health care system, and that's fine. If you want to do that, if you've got the money, great. But guess what? And where's that available? Japan and All France, of them? right? They are oh, Japan 90 and France. percent of their citizens. Ninety percent of their citizens are uh -huh. actually choosing to be on the public health care system than the private health care system. But why should it be a, a right? Why should we have to have it? it basically, says because, because if we have to have it as a right, then that gives the government an incentive, a motivation that says, "Hey, we need to be, be able to provide health care to our citizens because they." But that means it. that they have to pay for it. Who does? Have you ever the government. Taken a the basic taxpayers economics do. Class. Yes. So the taxpayers. Have you ever okay. Taken a basic economics class. What? Yes, I have. Yes, I've yes, never heard college, the expression. Yes, 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 there is no such thing as a free lunch. I didn't say healthcare was free. Have you ever free. heard of a free service for outside of slavery? By the taxpayers. That's yes. what I thought. It was being paid for by the taxpayers' dollars. I've never said that I was going to advocating for free healthcare. Let me ask you. All right. No one want to talk, sir? That's fine. Thank you very much. So, um, guns are a right. Are you going to pay for that? What? Guns oh, are right. Okay. Will you pay for Hold that? Hold on a second, sir. You're telling me that me, I have to pay for everything. That is not well, the Yeah, yeah, yeah you are. To. Yeah, you are. You are saying that. <laughs>
service speaker came a whole slew of different challenges from the unusual life. From heavenly mobs to renegade senators, we overcame opposition and now we stand at the pinnacle of victory. Quote, cool kids philosopher, 
<laughs> to all of those who have come to our meetings and asked, when are you bringing him? That day has finally come. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I give to you Mr. Ben Shapiro.
basic morality and basic law by suggesting that speech is violence and violent speech, and they are cramming that down on kids, which is why you have people protesting and suggesting that the very fact that I speak and say things that they don't like is some form of incitement or some form of violence. So we'll, we'll talk about some of that tonight, but late-breaking events have made it so that I've switched the topic of the speech. I decided to talk about something else, and you're all just going to have to deal with it because I have a microphone. <laughs> Tonight I'm going to talk about the dangerous game that's being played by two particular nasty groups who feed off of one another. I'm speaking about the radical left and the alt-right. Now, I discuss the radical left on campus all the time. That's because campuses are dominated by the censorious and nasty radical left. On the other hand, I actually did question whether I wanted to talk about the alt-right tonight. One reason is because what the alt-right wants more than anything else in the world is attention. They rant, or they cry, or they even sing their white supremacist, anti-Semitic, moon landing conspiracism into their webcams for hours at a time while insisting they don't care about attention. But of course, that's exactly what they care about the very, very most. Which is why they've been distributing calendars of conservative events and encouraging trolls to show up to ask pre-written questions designed to elicit balls from like-minded idiots who populate a channel gap. The other reason is because there is a great deal of factionalism on the alt-right. So the very term alt-right is controversial among some of its adherents. Some of them call themselves the new right and swear they despise the founders of the alt-right. Some call themselves America first, trying to hijack President Trump's slogans, give themselves the patina of credibility. More on that in a second. Some name their movements after mammals, some after amphibians. It gets confusing. It's meant to be. You see, keeping people confused is actually one of their chief tactics because it gives them room to ridicule anybody who doesn't understand all of those esoteric labels and jokes and beliefs. So why talk about the alt-right at all? The answer is simple. The radical left and the alt-right desperately need each other. Need each other. They're playing a game in which the radical left seeks to delegitimize anybody who isn't on the radical left by lumping them in with the despicable alt-right, and in which the alt-right seeks to make common cause with anybody canceled by the radical left. Specifically with supporters of President Trump, who have been maligned falsely as evil by the radical left in order to artificially boost their alt-right numbers. These two goals are mutually reinforcing. Now first, I want to just say, straight for the record, okay, the alt-right does not mean anybody who's immigration restrictionist, or people who are pro-tariff, or people who are more isolationist on foreign policy. It's a very specific set of beliefs. And what you'll see the alt-right do is adopt the beliefs of some of these other movements in order to find cover for their actual belief system, which really is quite viable. So here is how this game works. Let's say that you're on the alt-right, whatever your preferred label. I'll just call you the alt-right for purposes of this conversation because that's what you are. Let's say, for example, that you're constantly talking about white civilization. A nonsensical term, because civilization is not defined by color, but by history and culture and philosophy. But let's say that you say white civilization is under attack by multiracial hordes. Let's say that you're antipathetic toward Jews, you're enraged by the liberties guaranteed by the Constitution of the United States. Let's say you spend your days ranting about how conservatives and traditional classical liberals, you know, the sole protected force in America against the radical left, haven't conserved anything. You say that America is not a propositional or a creedal nation, even though the nation's founding literally begins with the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Let's say that you cite Christianity as the basis of your values, but you're more likely to quote Nietzsche than Christ. Let's say that you constantly lament the decline of our fundamental institutions, but you don't belong to a church, you don't belong to a bowling league, you don't belong to the Lions Club, you don't belong to the Rotary Club, you don't own a home, you don't have a grown-up job, you probably aren't married, you probably aren't a parent. Let's say that your greatest achievement in life isn't family, kids, church, community, but that you once made a semi-ironic meme that seven other people like you upvoted on Telegram. Turns out not all that many Americans agree with you. After all, your agenda is pretty disgusting. You also happen to have the unfortunate habit of saying really disgusting things when you think other people aren't listening. For example, your thought leaders, your self-proclaimed lead influencers, will say they're not on the same page as white supremacist Richard Spencer, but then they'll go on Facebook and post about the Charlottesville white supremacist rally, quote, the ruleless transnational elite know that a tidal wave of white identity is coming, and they know that once the word gets out, they will not be able to stop us. The fire rises. Really hiding the ball there, are you? Let's say that your self-proclaimed lead influencer has compared Alex Jones's ban from social media, a ban, by the way, which I opposed publicly, to a modern crystal knot in the beginning of a white holocaust. When it comes to the Holocaust itself, you have some questions. You do. And those questions are questions like this direct quote from a lead influencer in the alt-right. Matt says, if I take one hour to cook a batch of cookies and Cookie Monster has 15 ovens working 24 hours a day, every day for five years, 
How long does it take Cookie Monster to make six million batches of cookies? I don't know. That's a good question. No, that doesn't sound really correct to me. Wait a second. It takes one hour to build a batch of cookies, and you have 15 ovens, probably in four different kitchens, right to 24 hours a day for five years. How long would it take to get to six million? Hmm. I don't know. It certainly wouldn't be five years, right? The math doesn't seem to add up there. None of it really adds up. None of it really makes sense. This crazy cookie analogy. Six million cookies? Nah, I don't buy it. That's all irony. I'm an irony, bro. That's all irony. This is the kind of stuff some of these folks are saying. For the record, by the way, just so the facts are on the record, according to Henrik Tauber, a member of the Sonder Command, who worked in several Brokenhouse gas chambers, quote, we worked in two shifts, a day shift and a night shift. On average, we incinerated 2,500 bodies a day. The procedure was to put the first body with the feet toward the muffle, back down and face up, and the second body was placed on top, again face up, but headed toward the muffle. We had to work fast. The bodies put in first, soon started to burn, and their arms and legs rose up. Women's bodies burn much better and more quickly than those of men. For this reason, when a charge was burning badly, we would introduce a woman's body to accelerate the combustion. Unquote. But maybe he was just being ironic, bro. In fact, it seems like some members of the alt-right have a pretty large problem with Jews generally. They'll tweet things like, quote, so-called Jewish values tend to favor liberal and internationalist positions like abortion, foreign intervention, multiculturalism, homosexuality, and mass immigration. Some of you will say that you're hurting your daily existence by Jews. We suggested that a religious Catholic who writes on my website, that a Matt Walsh, is a, quote, Shabbos boy race trader who is throwing his own people under the bus and hates white people. In fact, Walsh is, according to you, an F word, that would be for gay people, P word, as in female genitalia, race trader who works for the Jews. What prompted that outburst, by the way, on the part of this alt-right lead influencer? The fact that my friend, Matt Walsh, said that the El Paso racist shooter should be publicly executed in brutal fashion. Also, it turns out, lead influencers in the alt-right not so fond of black people either. One particular lead influencer, when asked if having sex with a dog is the same thing as having sex with a black man, said, quote, they would both be degenerate. Really, really classy people. So, when you believe all these garbage things, and you've said all these garbage things, and you are, in fact, a garbage human being, when your views are obviously white supremacist garbage, what do you do? You take four steps in order to legitimize yourself. Step number one, the Trump gambit. First, you declare your allegiance to President Trump, and declare that you're not really all right, even though you obviously are. You show up to lectures wearing a MAGA hat in order to get the media to cover it, and in order to demonstrate that you are truly a representative of the 63 million Trump voters. You call yourself America first, hijacking Trump's slogan, what you actually mean is white Americans first. The media eat it up because the media love nothing better than, of course, lumping Trump in with particularly this group. You don't have to take my word for it, you can just ask Andrew Englund, the neo-Nazi who runs the Daily Stormer. He posted a calendar of events for all writers to attend and attack, including this particular event. And he wrote last week, quote, I think basically, we've got a model going forward that is going to work. If we get questions, we'll take questions, but simply being there and heckling in the audience relentlessly is extremely effective. And you can meet other like-minded people there this way as well. Remember, we're all good optics, na American nationalists now. Long-time readers will remember this is something I pushed very hard while others were dressing up in neo-Nazi costumes. And by talking about these issues, instead of saying, gas the kikes or whatever, we are more or less immune to being fired or kicked out of school with docs. You just, if somebody calls you all right, you say, no, of course I'm not an all right neo-Nazi racist white supremacist, I'm just an America first nationalist and a MAGA supporter. Now, this is a clever tactic. It is. Donald Trump is many things. He is not a white supremacist and he is not an anti-Semite. His daughter is an Orthodox Jew, so is his son-in-law, so are all of his policy advisors, or at least many of his policy advisors with regard to the Middle East. Donald Trump moved the American embassy to Jerusalem in a bold move of solidarity with the people of Israel. His roundabout named for him in Jerusalem. Trump Heights, Ramat Trump, is named for him in the Golan Heights. Donald Trump has nothing to do with these so-called self-proclaimed America first ass hats. In fact, he's very close to one of the people they attack the most, Charlie Kirk. Right, Donald Trump regularly invites Charlie to official meetings in the Oval Office. But, you know, these people bought some MAGA hats, so the left will spread their lie, and they know it. Which is why, again, they're encouraging people to wear MAGA hats to events. So be on the lookout. That doesn't mean everyone with a MAGA hat is an alt-writer, obviously. What I'm saying is that the vast majority of people who wear MAGA hats are not alt-writers. I'm saying the alt-right is looking to disguise themselves specifically for purposes of publicity. And step two, then you declare yourself the true conservatives, the true heirs to conservatism. Right? Not a bunch of masturbating losers who live in your mother's basement. No, you're the true heirs of conservatism. The way you do this is that you simply lie about mainstream conservatives. You suggest that mainstream conservatives are insufficiently committed to social conservatism. So, one of the things that all these people have been planning to do the last several weeks is they show up in the Q&A lines and they ask the same nine questions. So I'm just going to knock down these questions right now, and then we can actually have a real Q&A with real questions. <laughs> so they 
have been showing up to events and asking people like my friend Dan Crenshaw, Republican of Texas, and former Navy SEAL. Personally, we can go through these real quick because I don't really care about them. 
First, they claim that I hate Jesus. Okay, I'm a Jew. I don't believe in Jesus. I, I don't mean to be facetious about this, but like this is obvious that I don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. You see, like I have a hat. It says the whole thing. Like, true. With that said, I'm really, really glad that Christians do. Like, really glad that Christians do. I mean, actual Christians, not the fake Christians who quote Nietzsche but don't know anything about the Gospel of John. I mean, the kind who go to church and seek God's grace and love their neighbors. I'm very, very happy that America is largely a Christian nation. I wish it were more so. I think American-style Christianity is one of the best things to ever happen to civilization. Ever. My best friend and business partner is a lay minister. I employ tons of Christians. I've given them the freedom and the platform to share their faith. I've written one of the best-selling conservative books of all time that basically calls for more conservatives to go back to church and argues for the value of biblical religion. And a couple more of these. They say that I want America to fight wars for Israel. No, nope. no. Nope. First of all, Israel can take care of herself. Yes. Yeah. Right. Damn right. Yeah. Yeah. They say that I'm a chicken hawk. I want to send our boys to die, but I won't fight myself. Okay, reality. People who join the military are braver than I. They've sacrificed more than I. That is a fact. Also, no one in America sends people to die. People volunteer for our military. The draft has not been in effect for several decades. The people who join our military, they're not victims. And nothing annoys them more than being treated as victims by people who use them as political pawns. They don't need protection from me. I, like every other American, I have opinions. I'm not using the American military because we have civilian control of the military here in the United States, which is a very, very good thing. But suggesting that anybody who doesn't serve in the military can't have an opinion about the use of the military is like suggesting that anybody who is not a police officer can't have opinions about how the police ought to be used. By the way, our soldiers don't need the, the victimology, the sort of patting on the back of a bunch of weak, effeminate losers who live in mom's basement. They are protecting you. They are stronger than you. Okay, other ones. I attacked the Covington kids. I mean, this one is so absurd. I literally was on the phone with the Covington. I know them personally. I was on the phone with them nearly every night, guiding them in the media and through legal strategy. Okay, I haven't revealed that publicly until now, but now that this accusation is out there, I may as well say it and call them and you can ask them. Okay, they, they, they also suggest these folks that I didn't defend so and so when, I was, when they were banned from social media. That's probably a lie. I've basically defended everyone from being banned from social media, including people who have targeted me and, and created risk threats for me. And, okay, another one they like that I'm a grifter, right? That I make money. Welcome to America. Lots of sponsors. I'm very grateful for my sponsors. And I'm not going to apologize for the fact that I offer my sponsors a way to reach my audience. I'm very proud of them. I think their products are good. That's why I talk about them. And if it makes me money at the same time, great. I'm out to make money. I like money. Congratulations to the free market economy. a few of their more policy-based claims. When you aren't lying about me or Matt Walsh or Charlie Kirk or David French or Dan Crenshaw, these folks are busy playing defender of the realm by suggesting that all immigration will be shut down on the basis of race. Not on the basis of economics, on the basis of race. Let's be clear, every country has the right and duty to defend its borders. I was for a Trump wall before Trump was for a Trump wall. But legal immigration has been overall, not always, but overall, a massive boon to the United States. And the reason which it is not, that's because government has basically failed to take into account economic, education, and cultural status of new immigrants. The government should take all those factors into account. Again, economic, educational, and cultural status, all of that should be taken into account. And then we should welcome new immigrants to benefit the United States. This is all very logical. By the way, I'm confused by the idea that we should not be attempting to create a brain drain to the United States by drawing immigrants who are highly qualified here. If you're America first, why don't you want more smart, principled people coming into the United States to make us stronger and simultaneously for another country? They have questions about Israel and suggesting that if you're pro-Israel, this means prioritizing America over Israel. It's, it's absolute nonsense. If America had a policy that was not good for Israel but was good for America, I would back it. They talk about the USS Liberty incident. There have been yeah. multiple studies, US Navy, Joint Jesus Gas, CIA, House, Senate, NSA. Most of the reports, according to historian Richard Brownell, do not assign culpability for the incident. They focus on communications failures. I have to say, I'm a little bit bewildered why you're so obsessed with an incident that is now 52 years old. If you have theories that are better than those of the American government that got operators standing by, feel free to dial them and tell them about your five decade old theories about a military incident from the 1967 Six Day War. It's a direct and vital interest now in 2019. Okay, speaking of 
Europe. They tend to say that they, they like white European ideals, not Western ideals. Western ideals would be a thing, right? Because uh, you can read about Western ideals in books. White European ideals. And I'm wondering exactly what they're talking about. They're not talking about Christian ideals. You can read about those in books too, right? Or Judeo-Christian ideals, which I talk about, right? Instead, they talk about white European ideals. I'm, I'm confused which, what are white ideals? What do white ideals look like? Do white ideals look like you know, like the professors at East University who are overwhelmingly like, white and overwhelmingly socialist? What do white ideals look like? How about European ideals, like the socialists over in, in various parts of Europe? Are you really happy with how Germany is being governed right now, are you? Yeah. Like, what, are, what do European ideals look like to you? Do, do the white communists at Berkeley have these white European ideals? Race does not have ideals. It's just a melanin level. It's just a skin color or a place of origin. If you think it does, you're, you're absolutely indistinguishable. You're identical to the identity politics left, to the intersectional left. Spoiler alert, the alt-right is. And then the alt-righters talk about how white, white people are superior to others, but their own idiocy and bigotry demonstrates that isn't true. <laughs> they talk about the demographic shift in the country is ruinous. It points to the fact that non-white folk tend to vote Democrat, but this ignores that voting is malleable. The fact is that a huge percentage of California Hispanics vote for Democrats. 80% of Florida Hispanics currently favor Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. And Hispanics don't vote universally one way because, because race is not the basis for voting. Ethnicity is not the basis for voting. Culture may be the basis for voting, but ethnicity is not. Race is not. Again, that is an uncontrollable factor. Culture is a different thing. That affects how people think. But none of this is about reality. Okay, so we have step one, and that is you masquerade as a magnetic. And then we have step two, and then you claim that you're the true believer. And then we have step three, which is control, right? You just show up at places like this, and you say dumb things, and you tell your friends how cool you are, and you tell edgy jokes about the Holocaust and cookies, because, I mean, what, what could be funnier than that, obviously? Yeah, that's just good stuff. And then finally, and this is the big one, you count on the left to help you out. And this is where this nefarious lines that I've been talking about between the alt-right and the hardcore left comes in. And believe you me, the radical left will. I mean, we've seen proof of it here tonight. I'm here to cry for 40 minutes the evils of the alt-right and white supremacism. And there are people up there calling me an alt-right white supremacist. Okay, the left will literally call anybody on the right alt-right, even if we say vocally and in no uncertain terms that the alt-right is pure, unbridled, vile garbage. Even if members of the alt-right target those people on the mainstream right. Even if Donald Trump condemns the worldview. Listen, you can argue with anything mainstream conservatives say. It's a free country. We disagree with each other pretty frequently, but there's no doubt that mainstream conservatives are pretty easily distinguishable from the alt-right, but it doesn't matter, the media will lie about this anyway. So the Boston Globe will call my website, The Daily Wire, an alt-right outpost. We force them to recant. The Economist will call me the alt-right sage without the rage. We'll force them to recant. Over at Boston University, where I'm speaking next week, they're festooning posters of my face with a Hitler mustache, which makes perfect sense. <laughs> Students at this university will mob people trying to put up posters for a lecture. They'll tear down banners advertising the speech and replace it with a banner reading, Be Tolerant Except Racism. I challenge you to find anything in this speech or anything else I have said that is racist. Really, I'm waiting. Operators on standby. They'll issue a flyer that literally depicts me as a cockroach on a bottle of bug spray with the label Ben Be Gone. I do love that one, I will say. That was pretty great. <laughs> My favorite thing about that is that these people, they hear dog whistles everywhere. Right? Donald Trump will say something and they will go, oh, it's a dog whistle. I say Judeo-Christian values. And then they say, oh, it's a dog whistle. When I say Judeo-Christian values, I mean white people. <laughs> Which is obviously untrue. Dog whistles everywhere. Just dog whistles everywhere. And then they put out a poster literally with an Orthodox Jew on a bottle of extermination spray with me as a bug. That's not a dog whistle. That's you howling at the moon. I mean, my God. And then they're like, oh, well, you know, we just didn't know. Just, Funny, your, your antenna were up real high in terms of sensitivity for other groups. Weird that your antenna were just completely non-functional when it came to the Jews who don't rank on your intersectional hierarchy of victimhood. Very odd. For every other group, we have to be careful of dog whistles that don't even make sense. When it comes to the Jews, you're like, I'll put them on a bottle of bug be gone. There's a few right here. Maybe it's, I have a feeling, it might be because Unfortunately, for the intersectional left, Jews don't actually count as a quote-unquote minority group. And the only minority groups are the ones that they perceive are victimized. Jews aren't victimized enough, despite the fact that on a per capita basis, Jews are the most victimized group in the United States by hate crimes. And it isn't particularly close, by the way. But it's not just the students at this university. The media will suggest that President Trump is in league with the alt-right. Even at this late date, they'll neglect the fact that Trump has repeatedly 
condemned white supremacism, that he has purged his administration of people who are remotely from the outright, people like Steve Bannon. They'll simply overlook that Trump isn't a white supremacist. They'll declare that the MAGA hat is indeed a Nazi swastika. So, clarification for people on the left who apparently can't listen or read. If someone believes that all men are created equal, and men means like mankind, that's what the word men when it was written in the Declaration of Independence yeah, is. If someone believes that all men are created equal, that every American should have equality before the law, and free market capitalism, and small government, and equal rights for people of all races, that person is not on the alt-right. In fact, they despise the alt-right, and the alt-right despises them, but people on the left know this, they just prefer the lie. Why? Because their goal is to delegitimize the entire right. The goal is to smear the entire right with the label all right, to shut the Overton window to everybody who's anywhere to the right of Hillary Clinton. That's precisely why the New York Times splashed a photo collage on their front page of me and Milton Friedman and Dave Rubin and Richard Spencer. The goal was to lump everybody together and then suggest that we are radicalizing the American population as though Richard Spencer and I have a damn thing in common. For the first, for the first thing I can read, Political correctness is a weapon for the left, but it's also a weapon for the alt-right. However, Professor Steven Pinker, who the left tried to cancel for saying this, made this clear last year. He was saying that political correctness is a way for the left to shut down debate. By shutting down debate, they actually open the door to the alt-right, because they say, you can't ask certain questions. Then the questions get asked, they shut it down, and people go, wait, I'll just look online for the answer, and the first answer they find might be something from an alt-right website, and they start to take it more seriously. Like, this is something Steven Pinker said, so the left called them alt-right and shut them down. There's something that's the most nefarious of all when it comes to these sort of de facto playing off each other political lines between the far left and the alt-right, and that is that they actually mirror themselves in politics and culture. They both have an identity politics view. As I said, the left's view of American politics is that Americans can be identified by group. Americans are black or Hispanic or white or green or Jewish or lesbian or, in the best of all possible worlds, a half Native American, half black, little person who is gender fluid. Right? If, you, if, if you're on the left, you don't describe people by their belief system or by what they do, you describe them by their attributes. You describe them by group attributes. And they have a whole intersectional hierarchy deciding how victimized you are based on how many of these boxes you check. The only difference between the left and the alt-right is that they reverse the hierarchy. Meaning that the left thinks that hierarchy is bad. Right? They create this hierarchy where white people are the most powerful, and then progressively go all the way down to the bottom. You get to the LGBT people, those are the people who are the least powerful according to this hierarchy. And they say that hierarchy is bad, we should just flip the hierarchy. And then you have the all right, they say, no, 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 the hierarchy is good, and we should keep the hierarchy the way that it is. And then there's all the rest of us who are like, what hierarchy? There shouldn't be a hierarchy. What the hell are you talking about? What are you doing? All of this is terrible for the country, it's terrible for the discourse. We should be able to ask tough questions and answer them. We should. We should be able to have conversation. And we should also be able to see the difference between good, fact-based, rational answers and identity politics bullshit pandering, which is a specialty, unfortunately, of both the radical left and the alt-right. But the left won't have the conversation. The alt-right really doesn't want to either. They prefer memeing and trolling and all the rest. So, here I am, stuck in the middle with you. Anyone on the right or left who wants to have an actual conversation about tough issues that isn't the bumper sticker, but is also not willing to pretend that ugly bigotry is decency, or that identity politics reflects truth, or that trollish meaning is a substitute for an actual worldview. Let's have the conversation. Thanks so much. Happy to take your questions. First you go to family, then you go to religious community, or whatever community you're a part of. Then you go to local government, then you go to state government, then you go to the feds. Right? Meaning that there should be this, this sort of movement all the way along the line. I think that unfortunately in the United States we've reversed that. And we've said, okay, the, the option of first resort is to go to the federal government, and the option of second resort is to go to the state government. And at no point do you look to yourself or to your neighbors. And we've seen payments in cash form or the form of benefits as entitlements. And I don't think anybody is entitled to, to anything. I don't think you're entitled to that stuff simply by virtue of living in America. And I think that you should feel a feeling of debt for whatever you happen to receive in the mail from other taxpayers who are in fact that are footing the bill for that or future generations who are. So the, the role of government should be minimal at best. You're right that there are going to be certain circumstances where the government does have to step in. I would prefer that it's local government because smaller communities have greater interest in the people who live in those communities. I care a lot more about people who live in my city than I do about people who don't live in my city. I know the people in my city. I don't know the people who don't live in my city. Yeah, so, so I think that the, this is particularly true when you're talking about people who suffer, who can't take care of themselves, legitimately can't take care of themselves, I'm talking about the severely mentally ill, then people who are severely disabled, right? people who are, who are incredibly sick. 
Right? If you're talking about signing some sort of benefit check to those because everything else has fallen through, without creating an incentive structure such that the community is not incentivized to take care of it, that's something I could get on board with as a last resort. But I think the problem is we've seen it as a first resort. And so, if you get to now it's a question of direction. Are we moving toward a smaller government or moving toward a bigger government? Is the problem not enough government benefits, or is the problem that government has stepped in and quashed the ability of private people to take care of each other in order to make society better, specifically for individual people, right? When somebody in my community is suffering, they go to my shul and they ask the rabbi for money, and then we all jump in. I mean, I'm a big believer in charity. I'm a big believer in people helping each other out. I think it's better for them, I think it's better for society than the government sucking enormous quantities of cash out of the system and then injecting it randomly as though they're putting filler in somebody's butt. Hi, thank you for the talk. I just had a question about a comment you made at the beginning about uh, uh, transitioning from male to female or, or otherwise. Yes. You've talked a lot tonight about how important it is to let people believe what they want to believe and how the government and us have no say in telling people what they should think or what they should be able to say. I just wanted to ask, what's the harm, you know, if somebody's going to be ha a happier person because they say that they're a man or a woman, like, what's the harm in just letting them do it? I'm not in favor of government banning people who are adults. Children are in favor of banning because now you're talking about somebody who's not capable of consent. All of our, all of our laws are based on the ability of consent. that is frankly evil. I think you're making decisions for children who are not capable of making decisions for themselves that are permanent and have long-lasting, significant, and severe impact. Uh, as far as adults, if you're 25 and you want to get a sex change surgery and you feel like it's going to make you feel better, you have the right to do it. You do. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I mean, the, the, the research on this stuff tends to be somewhat conflicting, but if it works for you, it works. It's a free country. Now, that's really not the question that's being asked in our society today. Because I don't think there are that many people who are like, we want to ban gender surgery for a 30-year-old. And I'm not seeing the campaign for that. What I am seeing is a campaign on the left that says that my child is going to be removed from my home 10 years from now if I don't agree with the left's view of how I should treat my child's gender confusion at age four. I see the left suggesting that they want to find me if I refuse to say that a man is a woman as a general proposition. Or if I say that men and women are separate, then the left says this is discrimination. Or the left is going to suggest that it has no impact on my business if I employ a woman at Hooters and she shows up the next day as a man. Right, like that, that does have an impact on my business, right? But, but the, the, the left would suggest, well, you know, you should, you should just sort of deal with it. Well, it turns out that gender does mean something and does have an actual meaning to people outside of you. I'm not going to go along with the general societal willingness to rewrite basic facets of human nature and human biology, and frankly, mammalian biology, in order to suggest that a delusion is true. Now, if the best thing for the person is for the person to, to continue, they can't change what they're thinking, there's no way for them to get out of it, they want to change their body so they feel that it's more in line with what they're thinking, more power to them, that's, that's their problem. And as I've said before, by the way, I've said this a thousand times and everybody on the left automatically ignores it, of course. I've said that if I were in a room with a transgender person having dinner with that person, I wouldn't go out of my way to call them by their biological sex. I mean, it's rude, right? I wouldn't do that if I were sitting right across from them. But if you're asking me in a public forum whether a man is a man and a woman is a woman, or asking me to call a man a woman in a public forum, the answer is no. Articles that you had retracted in the past. 
I mean, we, in terms of what we've retracted, full on retractions in the past, that probably only be a couple of articles that it turned out not to be true, and so we run retractions. Um, you probably search in the in the bar. I honestly, I, I don't know. We've run thousands and thousands of articles. We run hundreds every week. Uh, as, as far as as far as corrections, we issue corrections all the time, just like every other news outlet. I've never felt the need to issue a giant editorial policy, also because I don't think journalistic institutions actually keep up with their own journalistic policies. Have them. So, is in the pudding. Either you like the site or you don't, either you believe the site or you don't, either you think we're lying or you don't. I don't think that articulating a policy, a five-page policy that you're the, first of all, I'm glad, I'm glad that you're the person who reads the policies. Because really, like, they write these policies and lawyers spend lots of time figuring them out and no one has ever read them. So congratulations to you. You are the person who read the policies. But I think that in, in the end, people believe news outlets based on what they find to be credible and not based on the articulated policy of the of the news organization. I find the New York Times to be credible sometimes and not credible sometimes, and, I, and their editorial policy has nothing to do with it, really. Yeah, it's fine. Oh, one more, yeah. Um, so, do you have any objective ethical standard, or is it purely based off of your subjective um, reasoning and interpretation of news, there's a subjectivity level. I reject outright the idea that news outlets are purely objective. I don't think the New York Times is objective, I don't think we're objective, I don't see anything CNN is objective. I think that the best way for people to read news is to read our site and then read Huffington Post, and whatever we have in common is the common basis of fact, and whatever we don't have in common is opinion. Hi Ben, I'm Neil. I study CS at Stanford. I am a huge fan of yours. I watch you on YouTube all the time. Um, I do lean left, however, so I disagree with you on some issues. Um, well, first of all, okay, quick, can we have a show of hands? People who are liberal to left in the audience, people who disagree with what I say, can you raise your hands, please? Thank you for coming. become violent criminals and end up murdering people. So my question is, why do you prefer the life of the unborn fetus over the lives of existing individuals? Okay, so, a couple of answers I can start I think there are serious challenges to the, the Levitt thesis that the crime rate, so the basic thesis of Stephen Levitt and Freakonomics uh, is that the crime rate drop, the crime rate drop is associated with the advent of Roe vs. Wade. The Roe vs. Wade happened, millions of babies got aborted, and then those babies that were aborted couldn't commit crimes because of the crime rate drop. The problem is the timeline doesn't actually match up. The crime rates didn't begin to drop until 1994. Roe vs. Wade happens in 1973. The vast majority of violent crime, or at least a huge plurality of violent crime, is happening for kids who are actually born, but who are actually who are actually between the ages of 15 and like 23. So what you would have expected is that there would have been a massive crime rate drop in the late 80s, mid to late 80s, not a crime rate drop in 1994. The reason you got a crime rate drop in 1994 was additional resources provided by the federal government and the states to police. Uh, so putting aside the statistical argument, now to the moral argument. So the moral argument is that that is being made by you, and I don't mischaracterize it, is that the probability that, or possibility that somebody's going to grow up to be a killer means that they are putting some quotient of life at risk. The problem is that you cannot kill somebody based on probability. You wouldn't do this in, in any form of life, right? If you, if you it, we, we can't have a, a Tom Cruise Minority Report approach to children or to criminals in real life, right? This is a big room. I'm sure somebody at this point in this room will commit a crime. Pretend. That crime may be serious. That doesn't mean that if I just killed everyone in the room, I've now prohibited the crime. Or if I killed one person in the room who I think is most likely to commit the crime, it's not going to worry. That if I, if I killed that one person, that that would be okay. Because again, I'm making a forejudgment about behavior that is not going to occur. So, 
it is true that a lot of people who have abortions are poor. It is true that a lot of people who have abortions may not have great resources to, to raise the child. The solution to that is not to kill the child in order to prevent possible future crime. The solution is that people should be having babies more responsibly and that local communities, particularly religious communities, should step in and help out when single moms need help. And by the way, that does happen a lot. Right? And that's something that should be happening in increasing numbers. It's also why the government should stop incentivizing single motherhood by cutting checks and playing dead.
It can be good, and it can be for everyone. But you can only have two of those things. You can't have all three. There is no program that is cheap and good and for everyone. It just does not work that way. Right? If it's, if it's cheap and it's universal, then you're going to end up with rational, which is sort of what you have in Canada and the UK. If you have, if you have universal and good, it ends up being pretty expensive. And that's kind of what you have in the United States, sort of, because the truth is that there is basically universal health care in the sense that if you go to the hospital, they can't turn you away, but it's very expensive in the United States. Now, it's also on demand. Again, like, we are the world's, the truth is the world has a two-tier health care system. It goes like this. You live in a socialized country, and then if you have money, you come here for your surgeries. Right? But, the, but the, the question is what kind of health system you would like to create. The health system that I would prefer is one that is cheap and good, but not completely universal. And then the gaps are filled by charity hospitals, the gaps are filled by local government. The reason for that is because the vast majority of medical innovation happens in the United States. It's very easy for everybody to live off the legacy of the fact that all of the, all of the best drugs are created here, all the best surgeries are invented here, that all of the stuff that the rest of the, I mean, it's basically like the American economy, right? The American economy goes south, everybody is toast. Well, if the American medical innovation system goes south, everybody is toast. There are no new medicines that are being created. So a free market system incentivizes the creation of new, better surgeries. It incentivizes more doctors. There are doctor shortages in a lot of these places. But Singapore is, is, I mean, we can get into the bakeries of all of these systems. They're all very, very different. Um, but what I would suggest is that America needs to move in more free market direction because more free market means lower prices generally and more innovation. It doesn't achieve universality for people, for example, who have pre-existing conditions on insurance. That's where you need charity to come in and, as again, as a last resort, maybe local government. Thank you so much. 